Good morning, everyone. Welcome to what must seem like the very early show after our third clock forward uh, in uh, five days. Anyway, I'd like to welcome you to this presentation. <laughs> it's the last I'll be giving uh, for this uh, cruise for us. And Susie and I, yes, we're going to be leaving you in uh, Los Angeles. And we've enjoyed meeting many of you. Uh, we've had a great cruise. Uh, we got on uh, 12 years ago in Singapore. <laughs> It's been a long cruise. We got on uh, back in Singapore, and it's been wonderful. We met some really, really delightful people. Uh, today we're going to talk about the geology, the flora, the fauna of California. And no, I'm not going to talk about the nuts, the flakes, and the crazy people that live in San Francisco, at least not too much. Anyway, it's a very unique place, and uh, it's very different from most of the other states. And then we're going to talk a little bit about its people and its history, and we'll be placing special interest on a few of the little cities in California, San Diego, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. By the way, this is a little trivia thing. If you're ever walking around in San Francisco, you can call it San Francisco, you can call it San Fran, you can call it the city, but do not call it Frisco. You might get a bath in the bay. California is located on the western boundary of the North American tectonic plate. As I said yesterday, that plate is, consists primarily of continental crust and it's riding basically along and over the Pacific Ocean plate. That's been going on for about 10 million years. Uh, and it's been moving about two inches a year, most years. It doesn't move at all. And then every once in a while, it takes a nice big 26 or 28 foot step. Anyway, all of that tectonic pushing and shoving has created a network of faults that exist all across the state. And being on the ring of fire means that California is one of the most vulnerable places for earthquakes. They have about 37,000 of them in the state every year, but most of them are too small to be felt. Most of them are less than what we've felt for the motion of the ocean. Uh, there have been several major earthquakes in recorded history within the state. Surprisingly enough, where we live in Sacramento, there has never been a recorded earthquake. That's why we live there. That, because it's a great place. Anyway, <clears throat> San Francisco Bay <clears throat> lies between the San Andreas Fault to the west and the Hayward Fault to the east. In Southern California, the San Andreas turns slightly eastward and inland from both Los Angeles and San Diego. That fault cuts through about two-thirds of California, and that means the state one day could split into two, geologically speaking. Uh, and also, the part that splits away will be somewhere up near probably Seattle. Anyway, California's ge uh, diverse geology and geography ranges from the Pacific Ocean coast to the Sierra Nevada mountains. The state contains both the highest and the lowest points in the continental United States. Mount Whitney and Death Valley. Surprisingly enough, they're not too far apart. Uh, it has the third longest coastline of all the states after Alaska and Florida. All those you can use in trivia if they ever ask the right questions. The center of the state is dominated by the Central Valley and that's a major agricultural area. San Francisco, La oh, the I forgot to flip this over. I just kept talking. Anyway, that's what it looks like, and you can see all of the fault lines that go across the straight uh, state, including the one that goes up through the Owens Valley. But if you'll note where the word California is, all the way up through the center part of the state, there are essentially no fault lines. During the last ice age, the sea level was much, much lower than it is today, and as a result, the California coast was much farther to the west. Most of the offshore islands were just simple coastal hills. At that time, San Francisco Bay was just a large valley with some small hills in it. Rivers ran through a canyon that was known as the Golden Gate. Actually, it wasn't known that back during the time of the Ice Age, but that's what it became known as. As the ice sheets melted, sea level rose about 300 feet over a period of some 4,000 years. The canyon that ran through there filled with water from the Pacific Ocean. The small hills became islands such as uh, Yerba Buena and Alcatraz. San Francisco Bay is an estuary that drains about 40% of all of California's water. Here the Sacramento and the San Joaquin rivers flow down out of the Sierra Nevada and enter into the Pacific. 
With a diverse climate and geology, California sports a large number of plants and animals. And we'll take a couple looks at the, some of the things that are there as the state flower, the state bird, and the state mammal. The California poppy is the state's flower. The poppy's color ranges from yellow to orange, and they bloom from February until September. Petals close at night or when it gets particularly cold or when it gets windy, and they open again the next morning but they may stay closed all day on a cloudy day. There is a legend, and I don't think anybody can really figure this one out, rather this was what caused the state to be called the Golden State, but there is a legend that when the first uh, pioneers came across the mountains into California, what they saw were fields, miles and miles of these golden poppies, and they called it the Golden State. Now if you want to visit these poppies, uh, there's a place just outside of L.A. called Antelope Valley. It's the Antelope Valley Poppy Preserve. They've got almost 1,800 acres of poppies in natural ha uh, habitat. California quail became the bird, official state bird in 1931. They rest in hollows and scratch in the ground. They just dig a little ditch-like thing, and they're usually concealed under foliage for people that live in California where these birds exist. A lot of times in their uh, bushes and stuff around the house you'll find these little birds. They uh, have eggs, sometimes six to 28 in number. Uh, they're creamy white and have little spots of golden brown. Uh, now, next big question ever you ask is, how did California get a bear as its flag and to represent it as a state's animal? The bear's name was Monarch and he was California's last captive grizzly bear. And the story goes kind of like this. Back in 1889, a San Francisco Examiner newspaper man, William Randolph Hearst, you know the guy that built that little shack down in San Luis Obispo, uh, he had a heated debate over whether the grizzlies still existed anywhere in California. Hearst ended the argument because what he said to one of his assistants, go out and find one of those bears. After nine months in the Sierra Mountains, they finally lured an enormous grizzly into a pen that was baited with honey and mutton. They named him Monarch, after the old San Francisco examiner, the Monarch of the Dailies. They transported the bear to San Francisco by sled, wagon, and railroad. He was a pretty big critter. Uh, critter. Monarch and company arrived to joyous parades. They had parades through the city and front page fanfare. Of course, Hearst wanted to make a big deal out of this because he paid for it. The bear lived in captivity for more than 20 years. After his death, they had him stuffed and mounted and given to the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, where he is displayed today. All right, let's go back in time and see how California kind of developed and grew. It was settled by successive waves of, of arrivals during the last 10,000 years. The indigenous peoples of California included more than 70 distinct, distinct groups or tribes of Indians or natives. They ranged from large settled populations living on the coast to very small tribes in the interior. Trade, intermarriage, and military alliances among the indigenous people fostered many social and economic relationships among the very diverse groups. The name California is derived from the Latin word Khalifa. That was taken from an Arabic Kali, meaning religious state leader. The Spaniards originally thought that California was an island, as was shown here in one of their early maps. The island was described as a fabulous place with gold, griffins, and Amazons. I haven't found the griffins or the Amazons yet, and I think I've seen the gold someplace in a museum. Anyway, but the fictional land was described as being east of Asia. A few thousand miles, but it is east of Asia. A mythical island paradise of the same name was described in, Sa in Spanish Romance writings in the early 16th century. Its ruler was Queen Khalifa, who was a pagan. She was convinced to raise an army of women warriors and sail away from California with a large flock of trained griffins. I guess that's where they went. Anyway, uh, that was so that she could join a Muslim battle against Christians who were defending Constantinople. In the siege, the griffins harmed enemy and friendly forces so much 
that she withdrew them from the battle. Khalifa and her ally fought in single combat against the Christian leaders. Khalifa was finally bested and taken prisoner where she converted to Christianity. Wonderful story. This is a mural of Queen Khalifa uh, and her Amazons. Uh, it hangs in the Room of the Dons at the Mark Hopkins Hotel in San Francisco. Khalifa, depicted as the spirit of California, has been the subject of modern day sculpture, painting, stories, and film. She often figures in the myth of California, uh, uh, the origin anyway, symbolizing an untamed and bountiful land prior to the Europeans taking the land by force. But before the Spanish arrived, the Diagueno and the Chumash tribes lived near the rivers in the Southern California coast. The Spaniards called the natives the Diguenos, uh, as was their practice to name them after the local mission. Uh, they became neophytes or, or acolytes and so on at the local mission in San Diego. And that was an area where the Spanish uh, knew, uh, called the place the Poison Oak Place because there was so much of that stuff around they were always scratching and itching. The Chumash inhabited the central and southern coastal regions of California and portions of it are now called, of their tribal lands, are now called San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara, Ventura, and Los Angeles County. Prior to the arrival of the European explorers in 1542, the estimated population of California ranged from 100 to about 300,000. And when you think about that in context to the total population of indigenous American people in the United States, that was about uh, maybe a third of them. Uh, California's native population declined rapidly, mostly due to European diseases to which they had no immunity, and that was true across almost all of North America. The 1542 expedition was commanded by a Portuguese conquistador named Juan Rodriguez Cabrillo. He was sailing under the orders of the Viceroy of New Spain. Uh, New Spain today is known as Mexico. Cabrillo named Southern California San Miguel. Then five more expeditions came to California from Mexico, both by land and sea. After storms, rough seas, and many hardships, the ships finally anchored in San Diego Bay. The land expeditions found the travel very difficult as well. They had to travel across very rugged terrain with mules and horses carrying food, farm tools, and seed. Within 50 years, Spaniard Sebastian uh, Rodriguez Carmeno was ordered to explore the coast of Northern California. He was on his way from Manila, Philippines to, to uh, Acapulco, Mexico, and that was on one of the Manila galle galleons that traveled between the Philippines and North America. Uh, Sermena discovered a large bay and he claimed it for Spain and named it the Bay of San Francisco after St. Francis. Yet he really wasn't where he thought he was. He was actually in what we know of today as Drake's Bay. Uh, then there was a very little colonial activity in Northern California for almost 200 years. That's probably because Carmeno's Bay was incorrectly plotted on the Spanish navigation charts of the time. In 1602, Sebastian Vizcaino landed in Southern California and he renamed it San Didacus. The saint was a Spanish monk on, on an order of friars minor and the city was known, became known as we didn't know it today as San Diego. Imperial Russia was coming along about the same time and they explored the Northern California coast and established a trading post at Fort Ross. Uh, this early 19th century settlement was the southernmost Russian colony in North America. King Carlos III of Spain became concerned because hey, Russia was hunting seals up there and they might come further south into what he looked at as Spanish territory. Carlos decided to build settlements to protect Spain's interest. It was really a political move, but the king said, well, I want it to appear as if it was just to convert the natives to Christianity. Spanish forces established a series of religious and military outposts in California. And the Spanish troops recruited, I guess you would say, the local Indians to build the missions. Actually, it was kind of conscripted. The first mission completed was at San Diego de Acala, which became known as the mother of the missions. 
Uh, it was completed in the middle of 1769 and followed by 20 more missions stretching north all across California. After the Jesuits had established a chain of missions in Baja, California, King Carlos ordered them to return to Spain. He felt that these monks who had acquired a vast amount of land holding and a lot of wealth from all of these missions and the farms around them were getting just a little bit too powerful. But pretty soon he decided he wanted to have more missions built, so he gave an order to occupy and fortify San Diego and Monterey for God and the King of Spain. It was decided to use Franciscan priests this time to take charge of the California missions. One of the first missionaries was Father Junipero Serra, who was 56 years old at the time, so he was not a young man when he first came to California. He was actually quite small. He was about 5 foot 2 inches tall and weighed just 120 pounds. When he built the first mission, he found thriving, peaceful, and hospitable natives. And he wrote about them, quote, The natives are fine in stature and carriage, affable and gay, unquote. They danced their natives' dances for our entertainment. That was written by one of his brothers. It went to sleep. In 1771, Father Sarah directed the building of the Mission San Gabriel Archangel, and this was the first mission in the area now known as Los Angeles. Ten years later, 45 settlers founded a village here that was known as Our Lady, the Queen of Angels. It was on the Los Angeles River, and the settlement remained just a small ranch town for decades. In 1820, the population had increased to a massive 650 residents. Today, the Pueblo is in the historic and oldest part of Los Angeles. But all wasn't well further to the south. The missionaries continued to try to convert the natives to Christianity. A local priest had a very good rapport with the Indians, but Spanish soldiers at the San Diego Presidio continued to harass the natives. Two of the San Diego Mission Indians became very unhappy with the new rules and regulations that Christianity was imposing on the Indians. They incited natives in remote villages to riot against them. In the middle of a cool November night in 1775, 800 Indians stormed onto the mission grounds. They set fire to all the wooden structures of the church. Uh, They attacked the Spaniards and massacred the priest. He was known as Father Jaime, and he lay buried underneath the altar at the present-day church. Slowly, Mission San Diego recovered and grew. 22 years later, it covered 50,000 acres. They were harvesting corn, wheat, barley, kidney beans, and chickpeas. They had vineyards that produced grapes for wine. The mission owned some 20,000 sheep, 10,000 cattle, and over 1,200 horses. And you have to think of that if you're familiar at all with that area in Southern California. It's an area that was chaparral land and largely desert when the Spaniards first arrived. Juan Manuel de Ayala and his crew became the first Europeans to enter San Francisco Bay by ship. They sailed through the Golden Gate in 1775, exercising great caution And I have to tell you, having sailed through that Golden Gate on ships that I had command of, you have to exercise quite a bit of caution because of the currents and the tides. D. Ayala put a wooden cross where he landed on the first night. He spent the next six weeks surveying and mapping the bay. His subsequent report to the Viceroy gave a full account of the geography of San Francisco Bay. Ayala mentioned the friendliness of the Native American people in his report. But it was really Gaspar de Portola who discovered the San Francisco Bay by marching north from San Diego. He named one island in the bay Ilas de Nuestra Señora de Los Angeles, or the Island of Our Lady of Angels. Today we just know it simply as Angel Island, and there are some really nice walking trails out there, as well as an early California museum. The Spanish established the Presidio of San Francisco as a military fortress. They wanted to protect their new settlements and also to establish a military presence in their north. 
This represented one of the first major efforts by the Europeans to actually colonize the Pacific West Coast of what would become the United States. Until the 1840s, the entrance to San Francisco Bay was called Boca del Puerto de San Francisco, or Mouth of the Port of San Francisco. In 1846, the entrance acquired a new name. In his memoirs, John C. Fremont, the first military governor of California, wrote, quote, To this gate I give the name the Golden Gate, for the same reason that the harbor of Byzantium was called the Golden Horn. Of course, he was referring it to being the door to great wealth in the foothills. In the late 18th century, Mission Dolores was founded in San Francisco. Today, it is the oldest intact building in the city and one of the oldest missions in California. Surprisingly, it has sustained itself through all of the earthquakes that San Francisco has endured. The priest began to cultivate European fruits and vegetables, and they introduced cattle, horses, and ranching to the area. In the meantime, in Southern California, Mexico was fighting for its freedom from Spain. It was called the 1821 War of Independence, and for the next 25 years, Alta California remained a remote northern province of Mexico. San Diego became the unofficial capital of both Upper and Lower California. This is a map of the United States of Mexico from back in 1845. The tan area that's up there in the upper left uh, area was known as Alta California. Baja California is shown in that blue-green that's on the left side of the map. That's the peninsula that hangs down to the south. The United States tried to get New Mexico and Alta California through purchase, persuasion, subversion. None of that worked, so they went to war. Anyway, but an incident on the Rio Grande River at the beginning of the Mexican-American War provided an excuse for acquisition of that area by force. An easy conquest seemed to be a given. I mean, the, the United States military felt they could just march in there, uh, but they found that wasn't going to be the case because there were people living there called Californios. Uh, primarily, they were of Spanish descent, and they would fight to defend their homeland. For a few months, the Spanish-speaking vaqueros turned the tide against the numerically superior U.S. forces. But nonetheless, they didn't uh, win, and the government shut down its missions. In the end, the mission system saw mixed results in its objectives to convert, educate, and civilize the indigenous population. Today, there are 21 remaining California missions, and they're among the state's oldest structures and the most visited historic structures. If you were born and raised in California, your outings from school often took you to one of the missions and the local pumpkin patch. Anyway, finally in 1846, one of the most controversial battles took place in San Diego. The Battle of San Pasqual showed the American Army of the West just how deadly an opponent could be. On a cold gray dawn, Spanish forces or lancers rode in forth to engage the Americans in the bloodiest, most hotly contested encounter of the war. Soon, settlers rebelled against Mexican rule, though, and what was called the Bear Flag Revolt. It ended when a U.S. Navy Commodore claimed California for the United States. Another huge development was about to make the name California a household word. In 1848, James Marshall was leading a work crew building a sawmill for John Sutter on the American River. Uh, they were camped alongside the river near Sacramento, uh, and of course Sacramento is the capital of California. On one cold, clear morning in January, he was looking down in the stream and he found a few tiny gold nuggets. Gold, gold, gold from the mountains on the American River! That was shouted by a man named Sam Brannon as he paraded through the streets of San Francisco. He was waving just a small bottle of gold dust and nuggets that he had purchased at John Sutter's Fort. That proclamation broke the news of California's gold discovery. The result was one of the largest migrations in human history. Nearly a half a million people from around the world descended on California in search of instant wealth. I still haven't found it. The promise of riches was so strong that crews on arriving vessels deserted their ships and rushed to the gold fields. They left behind a forest of masts in San Francisco Harbor 
and with hordes of fortune seekers streaming through the city, lawlessness was very common. The Barbary Coast section of town gained notoriety as a haven for criminals and gambling and, oh, prostitution. On September 9, 1850, California was admitted to the United States as a free state. It's kind of interesting to me that it only took a year for the United States to accept California as a new state. I wonder if the gold had anything to do with it. Hmm. Entrepreneurs capitalized on the wealth of the gold rush. Levi Strauss opened a dry goods business in 1853, and Domingo Giardelli started making chocolate. Other early winners in the, were the banking industry with the founding of Wells Fargo in 1852 and the Bank of California in 1864. Immigrant laborers flocked to the city and Chinese railroad workers created today's Chinatown. Travel between California and the eastern United States was time consuming and dangerous. Uh, a more direct connection came in 1869 with the completion of the first transcontinental railroad. It was financed by a group of businessmen from Sacramento. After that, a route was established. Hundreds of thousands of people came west. The new Californians discovered that the land in the Central Valley, if irrigated, uh, was extremely frutal, fertile for fruit and vegetables. Of course, now there's a problem with the if irrigation, but that's a whole new story. Anyway, more people arrived with the completion of the Southern Pacific Line to Los Angeles in 1876. Oil was discovered down there 16 years later. Within 30 years, those discoveries of oil helped California become the country's largest oil producer, accounting for about one quarter of the world's petroleum output. Of course, that's no longer true, but it was at that time. San Diego pretty much remained a mission community for many years after the Mexican-American War. There was a fairly successful fishing industry, but word quickly spread across America that San Diego had much more to offer than just inexpensive open land. The Del Coronado Hotel in San Diego was built after the railroads had arrived down there. Just after the turn of the century, the U.S. Navy's Great White Fleet made San Diego its first American port of call on its worldwide tour. The fleet consisted of 16 battleships, seven destroyers, and four auxiliaries, all of them painted white to make them more impressive. They had a crew of over 16,000 sailors, and those sailors remembered San Diego with great favor. By 1900, the population of Los Angeles had grown to 102,000. That put pressure on the city's water supply, and the Los Angeles aqueduct system was completed 13 years later, and that assured the continued growth of the city. In April of 1906, San Francisco suffered a major earthquake. The shaking lasted several minutes, and the city was devastated. As buildings collapsed from the shaking, ruptured gas lines ignited fires that spread across the city and burned out of control for several days. More than three quarters of the city lay in ruins, including most of its downtown core. San Andreas Fault passes through the Skinner Ranch, about 25 miles north of the Golden Gate. And as I said yesterday, I think it was yesterday, it ran right under a barn. There was a milk shed that was dragged nearly 30 feet from one end of the barn to the other during that earthquake. The earthquake and fire are remembered as one of the worst natural disasters in the history of the U.S. Rebuilding of the city was rapid. Amadeo Giannini's Bank of Italy provided loans for people whose livelihoods had been devastated. That institution later became the Bank of America. In ensuing years, the city solidified its standing as a financial capital. In the wake of the 1929 stock market crash, not a single San Francisco-based bank failed. Soon, San Francisco and San Diego competed on a world stage with major expositions. In the Bay Area, it was the Panama Pacific International Expedition, Exposition of 1915. Its stated purpose was to celebrate the completion of the Panama Canal, but most people believe it was viewed more as a city showcasing its recovery from the earthquake. Fair buildings were constructed along the north shore of the bay in an area that's now known as the marina. Among the exhibits at the exposition was the first steam locomotive purchased by the Southern Pacific Railroad. 
A telephone line was established in New York so people across the continent could hear the Pacific Ocean. I think that's quite nice. At the height of the Great Depression, the San Francisco Bay Area undertook two great civil engineering projects. They simultaneously constructed the San Francisco-Oakland Bay Bridge and the Golden Gate Bridge, completed in 1936 and 37, respectively. The Golden Gate Bridge connects the city of San Francisco with Marin County, and you already heard much more about that in the last lecture. What most people don't realize is that after the earthquake, or before the earthquake, Marin County was covered with forest. After the earthquake, they cut all those forests down to rebuild the city. Now it's just beautiful golden hills. But for the Panama, California Exposition in 1915, Balboa Park lies on the mesa to the northeast of the city center. It's a 1200 uh, urban area. Uh, it's a cultural center that's named after the Spanish explorer Vasco Nunez de Balboa. The site was placed in reserve in 1835 and it's now one of the oldest parks in the United States dedicated to public recreation. In addition to green belts, Balboa Park contains a variety of cultural attractions and those include museums, theaters, gardens, shops, restaurants, and the, the San Diego Zoo. Balboa Park is, and the historic exposition buildings were declared a National Historic Monument in 1977. In 1916, Dr. Harry Wedgeford established San Diego Zoo. They had animals that had been brought in and ported to San Diego for the exposition, and they were quarantined and would not be allowed to leave the grounds. If they wanted to take them out of the grounds, they would have to be euthanized. Anyway, Wedgeford has reported that to have exclaimed to his brother, quote, wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a zoo, unquote. Of course it would be. San Diego Zoo grew out of those exotic animals that were abandoned after the exposition. A permanent tract of land was set aside in 1929 and the zoo moved there the following year. It's a 107 acre tract uh, that's called the San Diego Zoo in Balboa Park and it's now one of the largest and most progressive zoos in the world, housing over 4,000 animals and covering some 800 individual species. At the time the city of Los Angeles annexed Hollywood, there were at least 10 movie companies operating in the city. By 1921, more than 80% of the world's in film industry was located in Los Angeles. The money generated by the industry kept the city pretty much insulated from much of the economic pain suffered by the rest of the country during the Great Depression. In 1930, LA's population finally surpassed a million and kept growing. Two years later, it hosted the Summer Olympics. During World War II, Los Angeles was a major center of wartime manufacturing, such as shipbuilding and aircraft. They included Douglas Aircraft, Hughes Aircraft, Lockheed, and Northrop Corporation. During the war, more aircraft were produced in one year than in all the years combined since the Wright brothers invented the airplane in 1903. Following the war, Los Angeles grew ro more rapidly than ever, using up more and more of Northern California's water, sprawling into the San Fernando Valley. The expansion of the interstate highway sy system really propelled the suburban sprawl or growth. In abstract, today about half of the fruit grown in the United States is cultivated in California, and the state leads in the production of vegetables. One important, other important contributors to the state's economy include aerospace, education, manufacturing, and of course the high-tech industry in Silicon Valley and elsewhere. If it were a country all by itself, and there are some people in the state that would like that to happen, it would have the eighth or ninth largest economy in the world and would be the 34th most populous. Today, San Diego is known as the birthplace of naval aviation because one of the very first flights of a naval aircraft took place there. Uh, San Diego is home to the majority of the U.S. Pacific Fleet and a variety of very important ships from the Coast Guard and the Military Sea Lift Command. Today, what's squeaking? <laughs> Today, Los Angeles is the most populous city in the state of California and the second most populous in the United States after New York. L.A. has a population of just over 3.8 million people, covers about 500 square miles. 
nicknamed the city of Los Angeles. It's a global city with strengths in business, international trade, entertainment, media, fashion, science, sports, education, and of course, medicine. Important landmarks in Los Angeles include the Walt Disney Concert Hall, the Griffith Observatory, the Getty Center, and the Memorial Col uh, Coliseum. The Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Grauman's Chinese Theater, and the Hollywood Bowl are among others. Los Angeles is a huge, very huge, modern megacity that offers visitors about anything they would ever want, and it really is a great place to visit. Today, San Francisco is the fourth most populous in California with an estimated population of about a million people, covers just over 46 square miles, and it's the financial, cultural, and transportation center of the northern region of the state. And of course, of all the highlights, any visit to California is a ride on San Francisco's world famous cable cars. If you haven't done it, it's a real treat. Today, California has several important seaports. The giant seaport complex that's formed by the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach is the largest in the country. It's responsible for handling about one-fourth of all container cargo that comes into the United States. The Port of Oakland in Northern California alone is the fourth largest in the nation. It handles most of the trade entering from the Pacific Rim countries to the rest of the states. Sacramento-San Joaquin River Delta is a critical water supply for the state. It provides drinking water for nearly 23 million people and supplies water to farmers on the west side of the San Joaquin Valley. And what is California without its capital? That's it, sleepy little Sacramento, of course. But whatever you do in the state, enjoy yourselves. And if you have any questions, meet me out in baristas when I'm done here. And since this is the last of my lectures for this itinerary, I'd like to thank those that make it all possible. Gary and Jean Ray, way back there in the booth, I'd like to give them a little round of applause. And to the rest of my staff, please give them a standing ovation.